Days of Thrills and Laughter proudly presents the first double feature title, especially designed for the members of our audience who are tired of reading credits. If you are one of those, watch the screen being formed on the left and rough it with Snub Pollard in that day long past when motion picture theaters were called Nickelodeons. For moviegoers who feel no film is complete without them, the usual credit titles will unfold on the right. Okay, bring up that name. That's enough. Sorry, folks, it's in his contract. Hold it. What a show off. Take Youngson down. All the way down. Let's keep this movie moving. beginning was some 70 years ago when man learned to imprison time in motion on film. With hand crank cameras and the sun for lighting, movie pioneers concocted the first photo plays and discovered that the surest way to please an audience was to make it laugh. The best of the early comedies came from France, where geniuses like Méliès and Zecca explored the camera's endless possibilities. In this choice example, Pierre hurries off to claim the job of his dreams, while Charmaine, his wife, entertains a few dreams of her own. A slight mishap fails to daunt Pierre in his new profession as bath chair man. This amazingly well-preserved film was made in 1904 just eight years after motion pictures were first projected on a screen. Voila, the awful inevitable moment. Pierre and bath chair meet Charmaine and boyfriend. Poor Pierre is torn between love and duty. 
So, with true Gallic practicality, he combines love and duty. Pursuer and pursued, careened through quiet cobblestone streets that had never borne a car, on a sunny afternoon in France, in a long vanished moment of time. Chairman. Comedy was undiluted by sophistication when both the century and the movies were young, in 1904. With the coming of Max Sennett's Keystones, supremacy in film comedy shifted to America. Entering the theater is Sennett himself, the movie maker who knew better than any other how to mass-produce laughter for the world. In this 1913 one-reeler, Senate is surrounded by a keystone who's who. The high-hatted villain on the screen is famed Ford Sterling. The helpless heroine is beloved Mabel Norman. On Senate's right is a newcomer named Fatty Arbuckle. And here, of course, the keystone cops. remembered for two contributions to the very lively art of the motion picture. One, the Keystone Cops, whose chases were symphonies in misguided motion. Remember that cliff you'll be seeing it again. Second unforgettable contribution, the Max Senate Bathing Beauties. Their saucy ranks launched a bathing suit revolution that snowballing down the years has led from the Mother Hubbard to the bikini. The 
the Senate girls kept popping up in the most unlikely places. Senate's comedy kingdom, the girls, the clowns, the old studio, the master himself, all have passed from the scene. Oh, to be a kid again on a long ago Saturday afternoon, racing to the local bijou to see the little man who had come up from Keystone to become the most popular comedian anywhere any time. On the screen in the cool darkness of the theater, a manhunt unfolds. The hunters are prison guards, sleepy-eyed symbols of authority, broad-beamed defenders of law and order. The hunted is the eternal renegade, forever on the lam, Charlie Chaplin. Supreme master of pantomime, Charlie could break your heart or demolish a policeman with one swift gesture. This sequence is from The Adventurer, written and directed by Chaplin for the Mutual Company in 1917. and 12 plot twists later, Eric the villain realizes that the escaped convict in the newspaper is none other than the mysterious stranger in the next room, who's dancing with Edna the heiress, upon whom Eric has affixed a lecherous eye. While Eric puts a pudgy finger on his rival, the nonchalant Charlie escorts Edna to the terrace. Edna is Edna Proviance, Charlie's perennial leading lady through his most creative years. Charlie versus the cops in a scene so beautifully timed that it remains as funny today as when it first flashed on the screen nearly half a century ago.
pursuers vanquished for the moment, the indomitable outcast skitters off to new, lonely adventures. Charlie was sometimes bested, but only by inanimate objects like this revolving door. We're watching The Cure, also made in Chaplin's vintage year, and considered by some critics as the funniest of his short comedies. Charlie's adversary is once again Eric Campbell, who resembled a towering and pot-bellied Satan. This is a sanitarium, and Charlie's here to be cured of the unfortunate habit of picking up glasses that are full and putting down glasses that are empty. Discovering he can't get rid of all of Charlie's forbidden liquor by drinking it himself, the orderly disposes of the rest by throwing it into the sanitarium's mineral water well. Mineral water, 80 proof. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
has been a big run on mineral water, and the sanitarium has taken on a certain conviviality. Ever gallant bows and passes on. From Broadway's sedentary stage came the greatest man of action the screen has ever known, the dashing American. On main streets everywhere, fans flocked to see rising stars, among them one who combined the athletic prowess of a decathlon champion, the grace of a ballet dancer, and the gusto, love of life, and bully boy exuberance of Teddy Roosevelt. Wilson is president, America has just gone to war, and we are at the movies, watching Douglas Fairbanks. In this typical Fairbanks film called Wild and Woolly, Doug is a rich New Yorker who dreams of the rugged West he has read about endlessly but has never seen. Downstairs, Doug's dad, a railroad tycoon, sends for his shoot 'em up son. There's a reason for Doug's bouncing enthusiasm. Today is the day he is finally to go west to the Badlands and Indian country, to Bitter Creek, Arizona, to pass on that town's application for a new spur line. In this bygone era, as you can plainly see, America was not as yet troubled by a servant problem. Judson says, Doug, you wouldn't last two weeks out there in God's country. Unfortunately, Doug has made one small miscalculation. This is the West he's been reading about, the wild, bygone West of the 1880s. And this is the sleek, civilized West of 1917, the West to which he's heading in his movie star cowboy suit. But the shrewd citizens of Bitter Creek want their spur line. So, tipped off to Doug's expectations, they're face-lowering their modern metropolis back into a blood and thunder frontier town. The eager, unknowing Easterner will be given a reenactment of pioneer days. So carefully staged, he'll never suspect it's not the real thing. Late that afternoon, while the Easterner chats unsuspectingly on, his hosts make certain that no one gets hurt by changing his bullets to blanks.
Doug's partner for the big shindig is Sweet Genevieve, the mayor's lovely daughter, played by Eileen Percy. While the dance whirls on, the wicked Indian agent arouses his charges to sack the town, since the townspeople, armed only with phony bullets, are helpless. And in the midst of impending danger, to no one's surprise, romance rears its tousled head. Something's gone wrong. No one scheduled real shooting as part of the show. Doug dashes forward. Must be told the awful truth. His bullets are blanks. Everybody's bullets are blanks. All they wanted to do was give him a taste of the Old West. Now the plan's backfired, and they're trapped. But Doug remembers the real bullets in his trunk upstairs. No one has ever approached Fairbanks in his ability to blend melodrama with gymnastics. seconds, Doug is loaded for action. These were the days of thrills and laughter, when men were men, and movies really moved. from Genevieve, and Doug is off to round up the rest of the rampaging Redskins. The Fairbanks image of a brash, likable, resourceful American, the man of action who always comes up smiling, was to make a profound impression on all the world. Doug gallops back to a tribute straight from the heartstrings. The mayor tells him he's never seen his equal in the territory, and he's been there since 76. Doug, however, allows he's been a fool, but he's learned his lesson, and he's off, leaving behind Bitter Creek, its thankful citizens, and Genevieve. was an uncomplicated era when all romances ended happily ever after. 
Yep, Doug liked the rugged West, and Genevieve yearned for the comforts of the East. So how were the twain to meet? screen comedy had reached its golden age. With elaborate equipment like this revolving stage on the Maxenic lot, a score of fun factories concocted the complicated imaginative sight gags that surmounted the language barrier to bring laughter to the world. To provide negatives for both the domestic and foreign markets, two cameras ground side by side. Senate's closest competitor was Hal Roach, at whose studio a flick of a switch could send tons of water cascading down. This was a day when you could stand outside any theater anywhere in the land and hear gales of laughter booming through the door. Directors worked mightily to overwhelm movie audiences with logic-defying pace and sudden surprise. We're about to see prime examples of the visual comedy that made the 20s roar. In 1921, Tollable David was the film of the year, and on supporting programs could be found a Hal Roach single reeler called Spot Cash, starring a brash little fellow with a most drooping of mustaches, Snub Pollard. Snub is the proprietor of a grocery store with its own system of aerial service. Snub Pollard's stock company included Marie Moschini as the heroine and Noah Young as the villain. His director was the creative Charles Parrott, later to turn comedian himself and win renown as Charlie Chase. fires Noah, a task about as dangerous as a zookeeper firing a gorilla. Noah, backed by the dispossessed Cracker Barrel set, decides to set up an opposition business. Of course, he has no lease, no money, and no stock. But to the imaginative inventors of visual comedy, who usually made up their plots as they went along, this was a small challenge. wall competition. Our scene changes to three days later, 
revealing a shifting tide in the grocery business. All is not yet lost. Snub still has his bankroll and Marie in order of importance. Another popular comedian of the early 20s was Al St. John. Ma and Pa beam upon their strapping son. The product of fresh air, proper diet, healthful exercise, and hard luck. St. John was a fine acrobat, a considerable asset in a day before process screens and high insurance rates, when scenes like this were thrilling because they were real. That's actually Al out there, dangling above roadway, beach, and bathhouse, so far, far, far below. For actors who flubbed such a performance, there were no retakes. <laughs> diner in the straw hat is young Oliver Hardy, near the beginning of his career, long before he joined with Stan Laurel to form the funniest of comedy teams. Years of obscurity and small roles still lay ahead for Ollie, who was already building his famous full roundness of physique. Hardy team was still a year in the future when Oliver appeared almost full-blown in this Hal Roach comedy of 1926, which with passing time has become a tender memento of a great and vanished comedian whom moviegoers loved more than they knew.
Many fans will be able to place the face, but not the personality, of this fast-talking medicine man of 1923. Yes, it's Stan Laurel. In the days before he developed the appealing, slow-witted character we were to know so well. Undaunted, Stan moves briskly on, for ahead lie new worlds to conquer. His patented elixir will not only cure all ills, it will also polish the dirtiest car. And there, at the curb, it is. Laurel began as Charlie Chaplin's understudy with an English music hall troupe, and flashes of Chaplin pathos can be found in this persistent salesman. In a Chaplin-esque finish, Stan Laurel shuffles off into the distance on life's endless street. In the unlikely town of Woodenhead, there worked at the railroad station an unlikely baggage master named Crovney Freebs, played by that classic slapstick comedian, Ben Turpin. His boss is Cupy Morgan, as addicted to kindness as he is to counting calories. Ben can recall that day long ago when he had a spring in his step, but never one where he's got it now. with a short hair and long thirst is Cameo. In a day when all other dog actors were heroic, clean living canines, bearing names like Dynamite, Strongheart, and Rin Tin Tin, Cameo is the only pooch with bleary eyes and a hangover. Later into the station waiting room stalks a sinister figure, 
He's Mowbray the Hombre. So tough, he dusts itching powder on his trigger finger. Hands up. Well, that's one way to advertise. By a peculiar coincidence, Mowbray always handed out free samples just after the farm belt had a bumper crop of cabbages. Other movie dogs were always racing to the rescue, but Cameo was short-winded. Now you can see why. Still later, it's a championship game of checkers between Ben, best of the backroom boys, and Cameo, who learned all he knows from the cat. In this grudge match, Ben's out for blood, and Cameo's out for dog biscuits. Imagine the humiliation of being beaten by an opponent with a wet nose, a long tail, and spots. Behind those potatoes, behind the front, labors the immortal Harry Langdon, who looked like a baby who'd been snatched roughly from his diapers and thrown into a soldier suit. His unit has moved forward, and mid-shot and shell appears white-faced, pathetic Harry in no man's land when he should be in a go-kart, the most incompetent combatant of World War I. calls for help, but when Harry called, nobody answered. This Harry Langdon comedy for Max Sennett was made in 1924. That year, a great war film called The Big Parade, starring John Gilbert, with thrilling and shocking movie audiences. Langdon used the same theme to make them laugh. <laughs> Wouldn't you know, it's the sergeant, played by Vernon Dent, who finds the plaintively friendly Harry more trouble than the enemy. Vernon has a new post for Private Langdon, one that should solve his problems forever. This 
is no time to argue. By pulling him out of that barrage, heroic Harry has saved his life. Sometime later, a simple French cottage. A winsome mademoiselle opens the door. There stands her dashing Lieutenant Langdon, for fate takes care of the innocent, while the wised up must take care of themselves. Back in the colorful 20s, when everybody was making whoopee, a masquerade party. Under two of those costumes are rotten apples, whose shifty eyes are on the hotel safe. The plot thickens as porters deliver the only piano that roars. <laughs> This is a coming out party. And look what's coming out. Martha Sleeper helps her boyfriend, the house detective, into a costume for mingling with the guests. He's Arthur Stone, who briefly starred in Hal Roach comedies. Arthur decides his outfit so realistic, the place is beginning to smell like a zoo. Under cover of the commotion, the crooks are emptying the safe. Arthur draws a bead on them, but the lion draws a bead on Arthur. The capture, and a beautiful example of how things were kept moving in slapstick comedy by compressing time and space. Arthur never dreamed he was also arresting the lion. Thank <laughs> you. 
Like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, at the end of the chase, that inevitable cliff. get collared, the hotel manager gets the loot, Arthur gets congratulated, Cupid gets Arthur's girlfriend Martha, and oh my goodness, the lion gets Arthur. But love conquers all. This is one of those revolution-torn republics where mothers scare their kids by telling them they'll someday be president. Wiliest of the bomb dodgers is El Presidente Snub Pollard. The year is 1922, which shows how little times have really changed. Underground, school days for anarchists, who double as quick change artists. Their beloved leader, Nasty Noah, gives an inspirational pep talk on how they'd better knock off Presidente Pollard, or else. Left turn. Gracious, right into nasty Noah's powder stained grasp. Somebody's mother. Somebody's mother, all right. Nasty Noah's. How could there be more?
are looking from a catwalk of an old Hollywood studio in the departed days of movies which appeal to the eye alone. What thrillers they made in that bygone time of action instead of talk, when melodrama wasn't watered down by logic. On the set, shooting stops for a famous visitor. The tall host is pioneer comedy producer Al Christie. The unprepossessing little fellow with curly dark hair has become a legend in our time. The greatest of magicians, Harry Houdini. It isn't generally remembered that the man who could walk through walls or escape from chains at the bottom of the sea also produced and starred in his own films. Here he is in a 1919 chiller called The Master Mystery. The villains seem to have Houdini in their power, but they haven't reckoned on his uncanny ability to use his legs, feet, and toes as lesser mortals use their arms, hands, and fingers. The unrivaled king of escape artists goes quickly to work. Notice the elevator shoes. Like many another king, Houdini was sensitive about his height. Houdini's toes reach into the vanquished villain's pocket. The keys are removed and spread on the floor. The correct key is selected. Carefully developed skills such as this enable the 20th century's foremost man of mystery to perform feats of magic that seem supernatural. Never did heroine face peril so dire or villain more leering than in The Man from Beyond, a hair raiser of 1921. Enter Houdini. Houdini and his adversary continue their fight on the sheer rock cliffs of the New Jersey Palisades. Houdini scorned the use of doubles, and indeed, who could have outstunted the man who could free himself from a straitjacket while suspended by his ankles from the cornice of a skyscraper? The villain has been dashed to his doom, but the heroine is still to be checked in her wild flight. The Man from Beyond had begun in eerie fashion with Houdini revived after being frozen a hundred years in the Arctic ice. Now, for a thundering climax, it switches to tried and true melodrama and the most majestic locale to be found in any thriller. Niagara Falls itself, in a day before continuing erosion, had diminished its grandeur.
Out of the past, by way of the drain pipe, comes the queen of the cereals, Pearl White. To the movies, filled with demure, lacy, helpless ingenues of surpassing sweetness, Pearl brought a new personality. The brash, jaunty, fun and adventure loving girl who can hold her own with any man. While other film heroines were sighing with unrequited love, Pearl was commandeering a car. In the Lightning Raider, Pearl shows her loot, a tiny relic with a built-in secret which motivated all 15 chapters of this 1919 serial. of the page and before your eyes is the most famous of serials. Indeed, one of the most famous of all motion pictures, The Perils of Pauline. In 1914, millions cheered as hero Crane Wilbur arrived to attempt the rescue of Pearl White as Pauline, captured by the Indians and condemned to death by bounding boulder. Pauline's weekly perils helped mightily to make moviegoing a national habit. Pearl White deserved the affection of her fans, for no star ever endured more personal hardships. first serial, which thrilled so many so long ago, may seem primitive today, but since then many a polished production with cast of thousands and cost of millions has come, gone, and been forgotten, while the world still remembers the perils of Pauline. This wily oriental was vanquished by Pearl with cheerful regularity in a number of serials. He's Warner Olin, later won fame as Fu Manchu and Charlie Chan. A clap of the hands and Pearl is surrounded by Warner's henchmen, flotsam and jetsam in human guise. But lo, a cool smile, a second hand clap, and Warner's henchmen are outflanked by Pearl's henchmen, an equally unsavory lot. Our heroine's out to recover the formula for a death ray, stolen by Oland as part of his mad scheme to rule the earth. Pearl dismisses her ruffians on Warner's promise that he'll reveal the formula's hiding place as soon as they're alone. It's there in that box on the shelf, says the villain, and nowhere was there anyone, adult or child, who didn't sense treachery afoot. Will Pearl get the formula? I wish I knew. Nothing can better express the spirit of bygone movie days than those pulse-quickening serial moments that were always followed by the fearfully awaited words to be continued next week. Here, from many chapter plays, is a cascade of climaxes, beginning with a menacing shadow of a clutching hand nearing Ruth Rowland, second only to Pearl White among serial stars. Two men, locked in combat, tumble down the steps of a ruined temple. The hero is Walter Miller. The villain is, believe it or not, Boris Karloff, in a time before his role as the Frankenstein monster, when the only makeup needed to indicate evil was to go without a shave.
tries to make Ruth Rowland believe that her sweetheart has been untrue. Serials bothered only briefly with such problems of the heart. Some really interesting problems are about to flare up any second. young serial fans, from such things were nightmares made. A trial by fire. racing and opening drawbridge. A pagoda at the cannon's mouth. to empty blackness. An automobile skidding toward the precipice. A racing handcar, a lonely trestle, a blind curve. Terrors of the Deep. Valley, New York, two generations ago, a traveling cameraman photographed this wild and happy trek to a holiday matinee. We are to join that trek into the very theater itself, where thrills and laughter have been combined in a blend that retains its flavor across the years. The film is Play Safe, its star, little Monty Banks, who, like all undersized clowns, was always being chased by oversized enemies. Monty runs into the most effective prop a thrill comedy could have, a monster locomotive. Meanwhile, beckoned on by the long arm of coincidence and the shorter arm of the scriptwriter, the heroine hides out on the self-same train. The throttle is accidentally kicked wide open, and the locomotive, which pulls the train, that holds the heroine, who's chased by the villains, begins to pick up speed.
Monty explains they're on a runaway train, gaining momentum as it barrels along full throttle. Their only chance is to get on top. Monty has a bright idea. He'll uncouple the caboose and release it and them from the rest of the train. But Monty takes the wrong position, which leads to the wrong step, which puts him on the wrong section, which ends up on the wrong track. Yeah. <laughs> 
Here are three for the road. A final look at the lost days of visual comedy when the great movie clowns were loved, laughed at, and understood by all the world, yet never spoke a word. First, Snub Pollard selling the illusion of soft-bedded luxury in the shabbiest of hotels. of a foot on fallen arches. He's Bad Bertram, who has the pleasing personality of a hyena with boils. Snub tells Bertram to scram. He's ruining the architectural sweep of the lobby. Roaches the Joyrider with Snub Pollard again as a would be bridegroom in the only elopement ever foiled by a faucet. Marie's father can't bring himself to part with his only daughter, not while she owes back rent. Fate's fickle finger flicks Marie into the back seat. But Snub doesn't know it, so denied the woman he loves, he decides to end it all. Snub zooms off so fast, he jams the gas pedal. Now nothing can stop that car but a demand for the next time payment. Charlie Chase. 
sporting a dapper mustache and dressed in an only slightly outlandish version of the garb of the 20s, he was the most human of the silent clowns and the screen's greatest master of the comedy of embarrassment and frustration. Charlie carries part of the puddle away with him in his baggy, waterproof golf knickers. Time so long past that the youngest members of this departing audience are today in their 50s. As for the laugh makers and the thrill makers, they too have vanished, leaving behind no successors, but only moving shadows. So the crowds depart, the show is over. And alas, dear friends, our little show is over too.